Well, hi. It's uh, it's really great to be here. It's been an interesting conference. Uh, I love the the intimate setting. Uh, we have uh, conferences in the UK through a, an organisation which is now a charity. You're sort of bordering the bureaucracy on the outskirts of being a charity, uh, and we have conferences in the UK. So it's I can appreciate very much the effort that's gone into this, um, and thank you for, thank you all for coming. So today I'm going to be presenting an idea that I call epigenesis. Uh, and looking a little further at the, the idea, the concept of consciousness expansion. What is it we're really talking about there? So uh, I'll give you a very short sort of uh, history. Um, in 2008, I started something called the UKC Psychedelic Society down in Canterbury. Uh, and there I got to know Dave Luke and Cameron and others. Uh, and in 2011, we hosted the first Breaking Convention conference. Uh, we hosted our second one in 2013. Uh, I then joined the Beckley Foundation for about six months and then moved to uh, Singapore to, to do immuno immunological research, which uh, mostly involved learning how to pronounce that. Um, while there, I, I ran the Shulgin Blotter Art fundraiser, which raised about uh, $25,000 for Shulgin's medical bills. Uh, and I was also involved, this thing here is a, it was a consciousness exposition at um, the, the conference of the uh, uh, Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness. I presented this talk, or a um, juvenile version of it, at Canterbury uh, about eight months ago. And there I called it a dose by yet another name. Because psychedelics, of course, have picked up quite a few different uh, labels over the years. Uh, eidetics, uh, Psych psychotomimetics, mysticomimetics, psychedelics, hallucinogens, entheogens, and so forth. Uh, and what we really don't need is another name to call them by. So sorry to burden the community with another. So I'll start with a very brief summary of what it is I'll be talking about. I'll go through this very quickly and then expand on each of the points. So the first is that the human system, the entirety of what is us, is aware of a staggering number of internal processes, psychological. Is this working? Is this on? It's working, but this is. Oh, that's jangling around, is yeah. it? Okay. Uh, a staggering number of different uh, processes um, at any one time, and uh, the vast majority of these are outside the limits of our conscious attention. I think of this or the, 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 the sort of conscious mind is being a sort of monarch in a, in a city who lives in a tower so high that he has no idea really what's going on at ground level. We get a sort of generalized idea, but the specifics are by and large um, out of our view. Uh, the human system, of course, from every level is, is engaged in dynamic processes all the time, from the atomic level upwards. I spoke about external bodies from the atomic level upwards. I don't know what an external body is at the atomic level. But um, that's irrelevant, really. So we're only consciously aware of very little of what's going on. There are multiple domains of awareness. I'll describe that in a second. And conscious awareness may expand or contract within and between domains. In a state of expansion, the human may experience conscious awareness of processes that were previously autonomous and unconscious. Choice is a word we use to describe a decision-making process that is recognized and may be interfered with by conscious awareness. Therefore, in a state of consciousness expansion in which some of these ordinarily autonomic decision-making processes are consciously attended to, sometimes for the first time, it permits an enhancement or an enabling of choice. Thus, psychedelics sometimes act as choice-enhancing catalysts of consciousness, or epilogens from the Greek word epilioi, meaning choice, decision, or action, and genistai, to bring into being. So some examples of psychedelic epilogenesis, I know that these are all complicated processes, but this may play a role in it, include spontaneous remission from disease, recovery from addiction, and alteration of negative behavioral patterns. So let's start off with a very... Uh, basic overview of, of the, the Freudian notion of the unconscious, the pre-conscious, and the conscious. That which falls into the conscious is that material which we are acutely and, and knowingly aware of. It's that which, which informs the experience as we see it, as we know it. 
This threshold of perception uh, divides the pre-conscious and the conscious. So say in the background there's some faint music, and because you're all paying such attention to me, you're not really aware of it. If someone turns that volume up, there's going to be a point at which we all think, actually, hey, what's going on there? That's a bottom-down, bottom-up uh, processing of attention. The, the uh, stimuli has become large enough for our conscious minds to recognize it. Alternatively, I could draw your attention to that music in the background, and you would become aware of it that way. That's a top-down processing of attention. So the pre-conscious is, uh, is simply that which can migrate easily into consciousness. It's that sort of broader area at the outskirts of consciousness that we can migrate into. And unconscious material, all of this stuff is uh, stuff that's inaccessible ordinarily to conscious attention. So let's have a few examples. We have loud noises. Regardless of what you're doing, if I come up and scream in your ear, you're likely to be aware of it. Faint noises, they're there. They're sort of hovering around this threshold. We can become aware of them, but we might not necessarily be otherwise. Recent memories. What happened to you last week? Important memories. These are ones that, that are in the pre-conscious. We're not necessarily thinking about them right now, but we could do. Distant memories, they're a little bit further down. Repress memories even further. You're going to really need some sort of mechanism to drag, it, to drag that into consciousness. Autonomic activity, the blood throwing, flowing through your veins or the, the beating of your heart or digestive function, stuff like this. And then right down in the bottom, we have cellular activity, what's going on at a really minute level uh, in the body at any one moment. So there's this uh, constant migration of material between the unconscious, the pre-conscious, and the conscious. Uh, this is uh, triggered by all sorts of things, associations we make, uh, bridges that go jump from one thing to another and bring, bring stuff in. Think of Proust having this Madeleine, uh, Madeleine cookie. He takes it, and suddenly this enormous amount of information floods in that he'd forgotten about for years and years and years. There you see a sort of mass migration of material going up that, that spectrum. So using techniques such as biofeedback and meditation, we can teach ourselves conscious control over ordinarily autonomic functions such as heart rate, brain waves, and blood pressure. This is a very slow example of a pillogenesis. Instinctive reactions and hyper-emotional responses can also be consciously controlled with time and effort. Think of anger management therapy. So these top-down and bottom-up processing of attention are both perennial mechanisms of migration. They're happening all the time. So domains of awareness. Ralph Metzler identifies four domains into and from which conscious awareness may expand and contract. The best way to describe what a domain is is to give you a few examples. So domains four, um, Metzler's four, firstly ideas, thoughts, and cognitive processes. Visual images, that's all your sort of sensory data, sounds, smells, tastes, and so forth. Emotions, affects, and feelings. And bodily sensations, the tactile, the kinesthetic, the thermal. So these are best thought of as the domains usually accessible during waking consciousness. They're the domains from which we derive information that, that provides the sensations that we have when we're uh, awake and not in a particularly altered state of consciousness. But uh, just those four seem a little bit incomplete to explain all the other phenomena that we may experience from time to time with the help of behavioral practices or spontaneous religious experiences or psychedelics. So some of these include out-of-body experiences, K-holes, salvia-induced alternate realities, death and rebirth experiences, dreams, psychedelic visions, DMT discarnate entities, the mystical experience, and parapsychological phenomena. You can't really put any of these in those four domains. So here are Metzner's four domains. In relation to the others, where these other processes and uh, experiences come from, Stan Groff says the following. Experiences occurring in psychedelic and holotropic sessions cannot be described in terms of the narrow and superficial conceptual model 
used in academic psychiatry and psychology, which is limited to biology, postnatal biography, and the Freudian individual unconscious. Deep experiential work requires a vastly extended cartography of the psyche that includes important domains uncharted by traditional science. My own version of such a model includes two additional levels of the psyche, for which I use the terms perinatal and transpersonal. So here are Groff's extra domains. Now, whether or not you want to add more to that or perhaps change the ones that we have here, I think comes down to your own preference for psychological model and ultimately whether or not you are at heart a lumper or a splitter. So I have a friend, Anna Makeda, who works with Salvia. She's done a lot of field work with the Mazatec. She's given Salvia to uh, volunteers in clinical settings, and she's compiled an enormous number of trip reports. A common theme in these reports is that people say that from their own experience, what they're, what they're seeing is, a, is sort of access to alternate realities. They're here, but they're also somewhere else in a different world, as someone else doing something that, that seemingly has no connection to day-to-day -day life. And I think this this sort of prompts us to think about some of the unique and strange states of consciousness that are provided uniquely by different psychedelic drugs. So DMT entities, K-holes, Ibogaine ancestral underworlds, stuff like this. So the question is, do all of these disparate experiences held from the same domain? Are we seeing different manifestations of the same material with different idiosyncrasies? Or are we truly sort of being witness to material from completely separate realms? If so, how many? How many stations can the radio pick up? How big is the job market for new psychoactives? If it's equal to the number of possible neural permutations that can be induced, that's going to be a pretty large number. Uh, but I think the, the simpler answer, Occam's answer, would simply be that we're seeing uh, the same symbolic material originating from the same basic domains, but due to uh, differences in, in ceremony or expectation or cultural factors that are emerging in very different ways. So that's the God with many faces. So domains of awareness, why, why is this important? Why does it matter uh, whether or not we identify the source domains of an experience? Why bother talking about them? Let's have a couple of examples. Think of recovered memories. <laughs> Groff writes that repressed unconscious material, including early childhood memories, becomes easily available in a psychedelic session. So if a patient has an experience that he thinks is a repressed memory, a lot of the time this, is, this has been traced back and it's, it's been shown that it is a genuine experience, but at others it turns out that these memories are later false. So is this material uh, derived from a vault of repressed traumatic material or from one of these uh, secondary domains that we can loosely call the imagination? Near-death experiences. Is the light at the end of the tunnel the result of experience within ordinarily inaccessible spiritual domains or from ordinary sense domains? Is it tunnel vision as a result of reduced blood flow to the eyes or are we seeing something else? The ontology of DMT beings, is this part of yourself? Is it a sort of Jungian archetypal beings? Or could they be independent sentient entities? The answer to that depends on the source domain of the experience. So let's change the topic slightly and look at expansion and contraction. Metzler offers two different analogies to explain this phenomenon. The first is watching television. Say you're sitting there, you're watching a show. If it's a contractive state of consciousness, you might be focusing on one particular individual. You might be focusing on one particular element of that individual, an accent, a funny moustache, a hat. It may be expansive. You may be looking at the whole show, the dynamics that are going on there, or perhaps the fact that it is just a show and there's a television and you're in a room and you're sitting on a couch and there's noise coming from next door. You can sort of expand or contract your focus. And the second is waking up. Metzner says that expansion is a very banal affair, and every morning we experience a, a, a gradual sort of expansion as, we, uh, as our consciousness expands into these public domains. As we wake up, we sort of, first of all, become aware of our physical body. We become aware of the, bod the, the bed that we're in, our sleeping partners, the room that we're in, the house that we're in, 
our social context, stuff that happened yesterday, it sort of expands and expands. But what do we really mean by this? What is expanding? What is it expanding into? Does expansion come at the cost of contraction elsewhere? When you're waking up, yes, you're having this expansion into the public domains, but you've also got a contraction of consciousness into whatever, from whatever domain we consider dreams to arise from. If we're having a psychedelic experience and you put on uh, an eye mask and you go off into visionary realms, yes, it's expansive into those domains, but contractive in these domains. Someone could walk around you and perhaps you wouldn't be aware of that. How can an experience be both expansive and contractive at the same time? We might consider an LSD experience to be expansive. We might consider a, a panic attack to be contractive. So if you have a panic attack during an LSD experience, is that contractive or expansive? What are we talking about? So I'm going to talk about four different ways of looking at expansion. The first one is acute expansion. It's, it's what's happening right there in the conscious, whether you're only looking at a very small amount of material or whether you're looking at a, a wider picture. Episodic expansion. Maybe you can uh, visualize this in an, as an expansion of the pre-conscious. Cameron, in his talk earlier today, described how during a psychedelic experience, everything becomes super infused with meaning. Meaning is association. The way that we, uh, or the reason that, that material becomes hyperinfused by uh, meaning in, an in a psychedelic experience is because there's more material in the preconscious from which we can make association from one thing to the other. We might see something in a psychedelic uh, experience and it reminds us of all sorts of other things. We start making cognitive leaps from one thing to another. Everything seems profound. Part of this, I think, is because there's more material there that we can work with. The third is chronic expansion. I'll talk about this uh, a little bit more. It, it basically refers to a permanent unlocking of material. Parallel expansion, in which domains are locked and unlocked. Think again to that dream analogy. So, using these models, we can answer that question about a panic attack and an LSD experience. Contractive experiences during an episode of psychedelic consciousness may be characterized as moments of acute contraction during a period of episodic expansion. Chronic expansion is achieved through all forms of learning. That was the third one. It is something we all seem to yearn for. Every time we learn a new behavior, if we learn a new sport, if we go for therapy, if we fall in love, if we, learn, if we go to wine tasting uh, classes, what you're doing is, is permanently unlocking material that was ordinarily unconscious. Think again back to uh, teaching yourself how to regulate body temperature or heart rate uh, through biofeedback. This is a, a, a epigenesis through chronic expansion. So I have a bunch of um, examples here. When you learn a new sport, you become aware of new muscles. You become aware of, of spatial awareness of how your body relates to the outside world and so forth. You've got a few more there. I'll breeze through them. So psychedelic action. Um, you know, I, I, of course, won't try to uh, address all of the many things that psychedelics do, but perhaps we can look at two mechanisms. The first one is a nonspecific migration of material into conscious awareness, what has been referred to as opening the reducing valve. So Groff writes, psychedelics increase the energetic niveau in the psyche and body, which leads to manifestation of otherwise latent psychological processes. Now, we can call these things nonspecific. Groff called them nonspecific catalysts or amplifiers of consciousness. But we also know that we can increase the specificity of that material, set and setting. So set really refers to the, uh, the, the private internal domains. Setting refers to the material in the external domains. Metzner's four. Well, not all of those are external. So uh, what we're looking at really is that Excuse me. Uh, well, that's expensive. It's just become aware of something new. Uh, um, I completely lost my point. Uh, right, okay, yeah. So if you don't prepare for an experience and you prepare very carefully for an experience, 
The difference there is that you have some degree of control over the material that's going to be brought into consciousness. If you have an LSD experience as part of a 15-step therapeutic process, you've spent a long time with a uh, therapist working on very particular ideas, and then you have a psychedelic experience in that context, the emergency material is very likely to be pertinent to that. If I just took LSD right now without even thinking about it, I have no idea what is going to come into my mind. That, that scope of material is enormous. This can be potentially dangerous. So Groff writes that it is necessary to structure and approach the experience in a specific way to make the emergence of unconscious material therapeutic rather than destructive. The other mechanism we'll look at is that psychedelics make accessible domains of awareness that cannot ordinarily be reached by most people without mind-manifesting techniques. So almost any work of psychedelic literature will say something akin to the following. This is the very first line in uh, um, Metzner and Leary's psychedelic experience. A psychedelic experience is a journey to new realms of consciousness. So choice. Let's look at that. When an ordinarily unconscious cognitive or physical process is transferred into consciousness, it may benefit or suffer from being newly amenable to conscious interference. Choice is a way of describing decisions that are made with conscious knowledge and attention, whether or not that is ultimately illusory. The less conscious the process, the less choice can be exercised in regard to it. So again, that's where material ordinarily falls on that spectrum. Breathing is something that we can become aware of quite easily. We can manipulate quite easily. Digestion, pretty difficult. If I gave you an apple and a pear and asked you to digest one of them but not the other, you may have difficulty. I would. Right, okay, so some of the many applications of psychedelic consciousness that we've heard about include the treatment of addictions, compulsive behaviors, allergies and autoimmune disorders, and negative behavioral patterns. And the common thread between each of these is that all of them seem to involve some sort of process that is not ordinarily amenable to conscious control. Why do psychedelics help? Because the migration of material into consciousness may, either accidentally or with forethought, be pertinent to these ordinarily non-conscious processes. So here is an example. Uh, Andrew Well is a physician, the founder of the Arizona Institute for Integrative Medicine. And uh, he's had various experiences of this sort. This is one that he, he uh, talked about at a MAPS conference in 2010. I was very allergic as a kid in all sorts of ways. I had hay fever. I got hives in response to various things. One of the allergies I had was to cats. Whenever a cat got near me, my eyes would itch, my nose would run. If I touched the cat, this would get much worse. And if the cat licked me, I would break out in hives. So I had a mindset that I was allergic to cats and didn't want them in my presence. There was a deep, ingrained defensiveness in my interactions with cats. One day, when I was 28, I took LSD with some friends. I was in a, in a terrific space. The world was magical. Everything was wonderful. And into this scene, a cat found it and jumped into my lap. I had a split second of the habitual reaction, and suddenly I decided this was silly. Why did I have to do this? So I started petting the cat. I started playing with the cat. I had no reaction. I haven't had a reaction to a cat since, and that was almost 40 years ago. So I've put two bits of this in bold. The first is, there is a deep, ingrained defensiveness in my interactions with cats. Deep and ingrained, this implies that it was unconscious. It was not ordinarily accessible. And then, I had a split second of the habitual reaction, and suddenly I decided this was silly. Suddenly, it had become conscious. He could manipulate it. He could get involved in that process. And allergies are, are some of the things that keep coming up, but also autoimmune disorders. Uh, people... Uh, who can suddenly achieve new yoga positions that they couldn't before by virtue of having new control over physical processes uh, or new understanding of deep traumas and conflicts. Too much of a good thing. This isn't always empowering. Uh, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. How many of you have experienced 
under the influence of psychedelics, confusion resulting from not being able to perform ordinarily autonomic functions. Walking, talking, lifting a cup of water, maintaining balance, and so forth. Quite a few. Okay, now keep your hands up if you think that, at least on one of these occasions, this was because you have to really think about what you're doing. You have to figure out and consciously direct yourself to do something that you can usually do without thinking. Quite a few. That's good. If none of you had raised your hands, then. So sometimes epigenesis is in the form of transference of material from procedural memory into consciousness, which in a, at this sort of helpless state can be difficult. Uh, it's been said that if you're playing pool or golf with someone and you, you're feeling competitive and you want to win, then just as they're about to take their shot, you say, "Hi, huh, do you always hold your arm like that? Do you notice what, what angle your back's at? And then suddenly they become conscious of it. They bring it away from procedural memory and into conscious attention, and then they don't know what to do because they, they have to think about it again, and they haven't thought about it for a long time, and that's confusing. So let's look at some predictions of this theory. Psychedelic consciousness may have therapeutic potential in conditions where the opposite of epigenesis has naturally occurred, and previously conscious material and associated processes have become unconscious. Some situations include incontinence and loss of motor control in the elderly, stroke rehabilitation, spasticity, and self-diagnostics, making conscious material pertaining to the physical body and its ailments. Something that's always confused me, or at least intrigued me, has been the fact that so much is happening in the body all the time that we aren't aware of even when it would be really useful to know about it. We can have tumors growing in the body. Our immunological cells will be fully aware of that. But we, you know, that never filters up. That bridge is never made. We can have atherosclerosis, and we have this heightened blood pressure, and our cardiovascular system knows about this. You know, these systems are not only aware of it, but consciously trying to deal with it all the time, and yet it never filters up into the mind. A woman can be pregnant, sometimes not even know that she's pregnant, and if she is, have no idea what the gender of the child is, despite the physical body knowing there's a, there's a different hormonal uh, balance there. So perhaps in the same way that you can increase the specificity of psychological material in, in therapeutic sessions, if we, uh, if we had, say, a 12-week course in physiology, immunology, pathology, and as part of that, we gave people a directive LSD experience in which the, the whole point was to become aware of the conscious body, to bring in information related to these physical uh, somatic domains into consciousness. Could we teach people to, to perform self-diagnostic scans, uh, to become aware of pathologies that they weren't previously conscious of? Now, some problems and questions with this theory. Where is the neuroscience? All of this is just words. That's not really enough. What is a domain? How do we define this? How do we identify the domain of an experience? What about experiences that derive from an amalgam of material from different sources? Oliver Sacks reminds us that every act of memory is to some degree an act of imagination. Nope. So right now, what appears to, be, appears to be material from external domains, what is known as extrinsic information, is actually mostly intrinsic information. It's produced from memory and expectation. So some advantages to this model. It expands a little on expansion. It may help encourage preparation and integration, as well as opening up new therapeutic potentials. It brings together seemingly unrelated applications. Oh, and I guess that's the end. Maybe I had something else to say. <laughs> but there we go. All right. Let's leave it there. Open it up for questions. <laughs> I'm sure there were other things I meant to say. Maybe they'll come up now. Yeah. I think it's quite, quite interesting. And um, 
the point you brought up was controlling the um, different um, bodily functions uh, that are normally unconscious. Mm -hmm. But um, what I can't really grasp is um, how should that work in the special case you brought up with the immune system. Uh -huh. um, because what I know about this is that um, this is merely a cellular response and the cell cells that act autonomously and which can be modeled um, even um, in vitro conditions. And so um, how would you explain if you, if you think that's true and you can take this model and say, okay, this is um, what it really was about, mm -hmm. um, then how would you explain that function? Well, so uh, you say it's merely a cellular process. Um, I think completely about, um, I, I think um, what I know about this, mm -hmm. what, so what are, um, what could be um, the not direct cellular sure, I, that are not connected to neurons? They're not connected, the they're not connected to neurons, sure, but for instance, if you look at some of the major advances that have been made by biochemists and uh, physicians, uh, biomedical scientists under the influence of psychedelics. So Kari Malis had this vision of what PCR was before he developed it. Uh, there have been biomedical scientists who have visualized on a sort of cellular biological uh, level what is happening and then developed models around that. So the, the model basically says that Cellular stuff is right down at this, uh, at the bottom level of this spectrum of, of accessibility to consciousness. Let's go right back up here. Oh. And it's very difficult for us to imagine how material that's way down here in these distant, dark reaches of the physical unconscious uh, can manifest themselves in a, in a way that we're aware of. And I think that this, this can also be looked at a, a sort of probability. We're very probable to be able to access recent memories. It's very improbable that we can get, get hold of these sort of things. Um, but I think we can use non-psychedelic processes to sort of help us uh, realize stuff like that. So uh, looking at the, the, the literature on uh, biofeedback and people consciously becoming aware, for instance, of, of uh, heart rate and being able to modify that based on uh, feedback that comes back, usually with external yeah, systems. Heart is a directly neural connected tissue. We have, um, I think it's better, um, I think it's more realistic to control this. Well, okay, I, so... So, so the... Seems to me a, a little um, exaggerated. Well, the, the assumption, I guess, that you're making is that material is only accessible to us if it's fundamentally neural. That consciousness is absolutely an emergent property only of the neural system, but not any of the other systems in the body. For which I would answer, what is the neural origin of the psychological elements of the psychedelic experience? Or for the Bwiti, people who take large amounts of Iboga and they see five generations of ancestors, where does that reside in the neural system? I think that's as difficult a, a thing to answer as to what degree do immune... Maybe Dave can say something about this? Or is it a question? In terms of like a, I mean, immunology by itself is a kind of... It's a very blinkered kind of... Mm. Uh, research and it's psychoneuroimmunology. You know, you sure. placebo and placebo effects, you know, we know about from hypnosis how important top-down processes are. We can't just think about immunology. We have to think about psyche as well. In Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, Robert Persig describes that one mechanic may look at a particular system in the, in the motorbike and another may say, no, that's not a system. You see, that belongs to this system and this belongs to that system. And the way that we, we sort of approach biomedical science is to, to draw labels around some particular systems in the body as if they don't all interact. Uh, my experience and the experience of, of, of um, a lot of the literature and a lot of Groff's work seems to be that there's more connectivity than we think there. 
But as for precise function, I don't know. I can't tell you. As I say, this is just words. It's not a bio, biomedical sort of experimentation.